Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Assembly Judiciary. Uh, Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Bilberry Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Gallant. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Ortlicker. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Present. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chair Miller. Here. And please mark Assemblywoman Gallant, absent, excused, and Assemblyman Ordlicker present when, if, and when he arrives. He's presenting. So there's a strong possibility he'll arrive in either way, Will. Okay. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get it taken care of. With that, just a few reminders that um, everyone make sure please to turn off their volume on any of their electronic devices. We also will have public comment at the end of today's meeting. We have three bills that we will hear today. The first, will, the first bill is Senate Bill 38, presented by the Chief of Staff to AG Ford, Teresa Benitez Thompson, and SB 38 revises provisions related to offenses against children. And so, Chief, your bill hearing is open. Is there any co-presenters with you? Okay, please welcome and introduce them. And then whenever you're all settled and ready, please proceed. And I would really appreciate it if you didn't sit in the middle because there's only two of you so that I have, yes, thank you. Good morning, Chair Miller. Good morning, members of Assembly Judiciary Committee. Thank you so much for being bright eye and bushy-tailed this Friday morning after a baseball game. I know you were all in bed by 9 p.m. last night. I'm very happy to introduce Senate Bill 38. The Attorney General's Office is hosting this bill on behalf of um, DA's Association and law enforcement. This is dealing with employees in a school district and communications with uh, between um, persons in power, administrators, teachers, and then pupils. And so with that being said, we have a very familiar face to you here. We have, um, we have Mr. Jones, and then down south, we've got Detective uh, Coldwell as well. Thank you, Chair Miller and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is John Jones here on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association presenting SB 38. I would like to thank the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General Ford and Chief of Staff Benitez Thompson for both sponsoring this bill and leading us forward as we navigated the legislative process. And as the Chief of Staff indicated, uh, Detective Matthew Caldwell from the Clark County Police Department, uh, Clark County School District of Police Department is present as well. And before I begin my testimony, I would like to point out that today is the final day of Teacher Appreciation Week. And so I cannot begin this presentation without acknowledging the countless teachers who make a difference in the lives of our children. And I would like, as a point of personal privilege, to take a special shout out to my own mother, who was a teacher for 42 years. But unfortunately, as in every profession, we do have bad actors, those who seek to exploit those who they are entrusted to protect. And that leads me to SB 38. And it is a compromised piece of legislation. We did work on the other side with senators, with the AG's office, with the public defenders, and the coalition to end domestic and sexual violence to uh, the place that we are at today. SB 38 creates the crime of luring a pupil. And generally speaking, luring um, is the communications, texts, calls that occur leading up to the commission of an unlawful act, but not the unlawful act itself. And there is presently a luring uh, crime in statute. That's NRS 201-560. However, that specific statute requires that the victim be either under 16 years of age or have a mental illness, and that the perpetrator be more than five years older than the alleged victim. 
So this gap in that luring statute does not cover some of the crucial ages that we see in our school settings. We have 16, 17, and even 18 year olds in our school that are not covered by the present luring statute. So as law enforcement, we are unable to prosecute some egregious communication that does, not, that does meet the element of luring, but because of the victim's age, we are not able to prosecute. And generally, we catch this before the intended conduct was actually completed. Parents discover the text, other teachers and students note the suspicious behavior or conduct and notify the appropriate authorities or administration. What we are left with are communications that evidence an intent to commit a crime, but that do not rise to the level of being prosecutable. Thus, we are presenting um, SB 38. Now, I want to start with Section 2. Section 2 is the bulk of the new bill. Section 2, subsection 1, prohibits a person with authority over a student under 18 from contacting or communicating with a pupil with the intent to lure that pupil from their home or a place where their parents know they are to be with the intent to one, engage in the commission of a crime punishable as a felony or gross misdemeanor, or cause a, the, or encourage the pupil to engage in an unlawful act that if committed by an adult would be a felony or gross misdemeanor, or facilitate the commission um, of a crime punishable as a felony or gross misdemeanor. Now I want to point out that subsection 1 does limit the pupil to under the age of 18 because at the age of 18 a pupil no longer needs a parent's permission to leave the house. So I understand that this could you know, uh, exempt some kids in a school setting, but discussing this matter with um, LCB as we were drafting the legislation, we believe it would cause more problems than it would solve by removing the 18 um, age limit in subsection 1. Subsection 2, sub 2, prohibits a person with authority over a student from contact or communication with any pupil, regardless of age, with the intent to either engage in the commission of a felony or gross misdemeanor crime, or cause or encourage the pupil to engage in sexual conduct, use of a communication device to transmit a sexual image or sexting, engage in any illegal act that would be punishable as a felony or gross if the student were an adult, or facilitate the person in committing a felony or gross misdemeanor. Now, the crimes listed in both subsection 1 and subsection 2 would be punished as a Category C felony, meaning 1 to 5 years in the Nevada Department of Corrections, but I'll note the crime would be probationable. These provisions do not apply, apply to a person who is married to the pupil or who did not have contact with the pupil during the course of their employment. And they do not apply to a situation where the pupil contacts the school employee and the employee promptly reports the matter to administration or authorities. Additionally, a person with authority over a child is defined as someone who is employed or volunteers at a school and who had contact with the student. This would include teachers, coaches, administrators, and potentially other employees, but it would be a fact-based analysis on whether or not they had contact with the particular student. I will note this is similar to the student-teacher sex contact statute, which requires contact by someone who is employed or volunteers in order to meet the definition. And further, the definition of sexual conduct for purposes of this statute does include conduct that occurs through the use of an electronic device, even though the uh, person and the student may be in different locations. The legislation also makes conforming amendments to numerous other statutes, and that's why we're dealing with uh, such a, a thick bill here. Section 1, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 16 and 17 adds this new crime to various definitions of sexual offenses or crimes against a child that are located throughout NRS. This is similar to our current luring statute. This crime uh, would also be subject to registration based on these conforming amendments. Section 5 adds this new offense to the list of offenses prohibiting a judge from ordering a psychological exam on a victim. 
Section 6 adds this crime to the crimes subject to lifetime supervision. Section 9 adds a requirement that a judge uh, prohibit a person convicted of this crime from using certain devices as a condition of probation. Section 14 defines this offense as Tier 2 for purposes of registration. Section 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28 authorizes the use of this conviction for various employment and licensing decisions made by schools or boards of education. Section 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33 requires school districts to notify law enforcement and child welfare agencies of these allegations and prescribe how child welfare agencies conduct their investigations. Sections 34, 35, and 36 adds this to the list of offenses kept in the central repository um, concerning records of substantiated abuse and neglect of children allegations. So the remaining sections make conforming changes. With that, uh, Chair Miller, I will turn this over to Detective Caldwell down south. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Caldwell. I'm a detective with school police where I've worked for approximately 16 years. I'd just like to talk to you about a, a case example we have that really outlines the, the need for this change to the NRS. Um, I'm going to use pseudonyms for the teacher and the student that were involved just to kind of protect their identities. So I'm going to start with um, the teacher, we're going to call him John, the student, we're going to call her Sarah. John sent numerous inappropriate text messages and had inappropriate conversations with Sarah, a student from his class. John told Sarah he wanted to have five kids with her, have Sarah move in with him, told Sarah her body was perfect, and he liked that she dreamed about them together. John via text said that he would get fired for talking to Sarah like this, but it was worth it. John had food delivered to Sarah's residence on Valentine's Day and showed up to one of her classes looking for her. Sarah said these actions caused her to become frightened, so much so that she blocked John's number in her phone. Sarah was visibly upset and stated she was scared when interviewed. She was concerned that John knew where she lived, which is especially troubling as Sarah never gave John her address. John likely accessed the student database to gain access to her address. John defended his relationship by stating the following in a text conversation. The legal age of consent in Nevada is 16. It does not excuse it, but maybe that will help you breathe easier. He's having a conversation with a third party about this. I'm pretty sure I'm not getting arrested. Worst case, they can fire me. There is precedent for my case, and that staff member did not get arrested. Exact same situation, they suspended the teacher, their name was not released, and they resigned. Because it was not physical, I, think, I don't think I'm in hot water. I'd like to share just a few of the text messages with um, the assembly as well. From Sarah, I have major body dysmorphia, and I don't know why I dislike myself as much as I do. For right now, I'm, so, I'm sorry that I say it a lot. John says, your body is perfect, though. John later says, oh, yeah, I mean, you look really good with green eyes, but I like your brown eyes. John again, hopefully I see you before the weekend, maybe even tomorrow. Another message from John, ha ha, okay, I'm back in room for 7th if you want to hang out. John later says, oh, well, if you need anything, let me know. That's a lot of stuff to deal with for one night. I can have food delivered to the house you're sitting at so you can eat. From Sarah, thank you, but it's okay. I really appreciate all you do. From John, uh, yeah, I'm also being selfish, though, because I'm too tired to come. If you're too tired to come to school, I don't think I get to see you. Sarah says later in conversation, I don't know what to wear tomorrow. Sarah again says, nothing is the answer then because I'm going nuts. Uh, John says, ha ha, that's so weird. John again, I wish I was just thinking about saying nothing. From John, I could lose my job for talking to you like this, but I do it anyway because you're worth it. Sarah says, I really want to have kids one day. John, yeah, you should have two of them and raise them on a farm. From Sarah, sounds perfect to me, like a dream come true. John says, yep, me too. Weirdly enough, I'm pretty sure talking about this with you is exactly my dream come true. There, there's a lot more messages I can go over if you wish, but this really illustrates how a staff member has special access to a student. A student has a conversation with them talking about um, things that a, a teenager would talk about, you know, not being comfortable with their body, and the teacher uses that as an opportunity to gain uh, access to that student and exploit it. Um, Sarah later told one of her friends that she blocked her teacher and that he honestly scares the S out of me. I'm trying so hard to dodge him, but he came to my class today 
and ask where I've been. This case is a clear example of a teacher who abused his trusted position in an attempt to engage in a sexual relationship with a student. John sent numerous messages to Sarah through the grooming process, drove to her home to drop off food items, and even showed up in her classroom when she tried to avoid him. John defended his attempted relationship with Sarah by stating it was not a crime because she was older than 16. We must do everything we can to stop predatory behavior by the most trusted persons within our community. Every child has a right to feel safe and be free from sexual exploitation, especially when, a school, when in a school setting amongst trusted staff members. And I'd like to talk about uh, CCSD's policy they have too. It's a policy 4100. And if you'd like, I could read what that policy goes over, but it basically covers communication between staff members and students. Would, would anybody like to hear that? No, if you could just continue with the policy in the bill, please. I'm sorry, that's, that's all I have from there. Just, I, I just wanted to talk about, you know, I could talk about the policy that CCSD currently has. It basically addresses a lot of these issues that are uh, brought forward in this bill. Um, so this would not be, changing this, this law should be almost, uh, it should be a pretty easy transition for staff members to understand because they already have policy that covers many of the things that are in here. It just doesn't criminalize the behavior. It makes it an administrative violation. But I get pass it back to John now unless anybody has questions for me. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think that completes the presentation. We're all, both of us are available for any questions that the committee may have. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for presenting this uh, policy. I think as a teacher, what you're describing is pretty horrifying, and, and I think most people in the room are um, in a similar place. My question is on page 7 on the exceptions. So I'm looking at sub 3. Um, I just had a, a two-part question. One, how often is it that a pupil is married to someone in the school? Because I have never seen that. And number two, I, I'm concerned where it says does it did or does not have or did not have contact with a pupil in the course of performing any of his or her duties. So if there's a teacher in the school and he just sees the student after school every day at 7-Eleven because that's where they go hang out and get their snacks, they would not be subject to this. Is that correct? John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, all of that is correct. And I will note that NRS 201.540 prohibits sexual contact between uh, school employees and volunteers, and it has that exact same language in it. So um, 201.5401C2 has the, with whom the person has had contact in performing his duties as an employee. So the reason that's in this luring statute is because it was pulled from the sexual conduct between uh, employees or volunteers uh, statute as well. So we're trying to mirror them as much as possible. Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here and, and for the bill. Um, Actually, is it Mr. Cald Caldwell? Did I get the name right? Yes, it is, Matthew Caldwell. Thank you. Um, I actually was interested in hearing a little bit, uh, if the chair would indulge it, if it's really long, trying to understand what CCSD has in statute. Assemblywoman, you, you can look that up. I'll send that to you. We have okay. the policy. Yeah. Okay. So essentially what we're looking to do, so I understand it, is – to codify really for the state, because CCSD has maybe what their rules are about communication, and I'm sure maybe other school districts do, but this would make it more uniform, would um, give those protections across the state rather than piecemealing county by county for, for school districts. Is that what we're trying to do as well? And, and to add the penalizing portion of it instead of just administratively. Mr. Jones, can you respond to that? John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, uh, of course, Chair. Uh, yes, that is exactly what we're trying to do. And, and a follow-up real quick. Mm -hmm. um, what Could you tell us, Mr. Caldwell, the age? I, I, I got that the age was for the female in those texts where was, she was over 16. Do we know what the age was of, of, the, of the employee? 
Matthew Caldwell, for the record. The aging employee, I believe he was a, approximately uh, 38 years of age. Um, and just to answer your other question, too, the, uh, the, the thing I'm referring to from the Clark County School District is um, it's 4100 is the, um, the number on it. Regulation 4100, I'm sorry. I don't know why I couldn't say that, but Regulation 4100. And I actually emailed that to John Jones. He could probably just forward that over to you if you wish. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate Thank it. You so much. Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this. In Section 2, it says a person in a position or authority, so just making sure uh, who knowingly contacts or communicates, so making sure this is not just teachers, this is anybody like a coach or someone in an outside of a school setting, too. Thank you, John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association. In Section 2, Sub 4, a person in position of authority is defined as um, an employee or volunteer who has had contact um, with the people in the course of their duties. So yes, it would be broader than just teachers. If we have a, um, a custodian at the school who we can show has had contact with a the child, then even they would be uh, covered by the statute. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Chair. And then um, would that include community-based organizations? So they're not related to a school, but this could still happen. John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, um, the volunteer, I think, is where they would uh, fall under if they were a volunteer at the school. I, I, I appreciate the Assemblywoman's question because that was one of my questions, of course. Um, you know, again, always targeting teachers and educators. But again, what about the churches, the camps, the uh, daycare facilities, the scouts programs, children's stores? all of these other places. And again, we know that churches rank much higher than schools when it comes to this. So w is there a law against that for them? John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, SB 38 does not cover those behaviors, but if uh, you wanna propose an amendment uh, to ex expand it to other areas in which children are uh, vulnerable, we would be more than happy to engage in that discussion. Thank you. Did that clarify for you, Assemblywoman? Next question from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for the presentation on this bill. Um, in, your, in your intro remarks, you talked about how it's currently um, illegal to, uh, to have contact with someone under 16, and so you're trying to close that gap. But what I'm wondering is why not just adjust that age in that statute? Uh, why add a whole other section uh, to NRS? John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, uh, the short answer is other other laws regarding teachers are kind of grouped together and so we're trying to keep this law consistent with those and that's why we were unable to add this into 201560. Assemblywoman Hardy. Um, so my question is in sub four on page seven, letter C, where it says a pupil means a person who is or was enrolled in attending a school. So what if it's not found out, say, till when the student graduates or, you know, leaves the school and goes somewhere else? I mean, could you still go after someone for this? John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, yes, as long as the applicable statute of limitations has not passed. Um, and for uh, this offense, uh, depending on if it was in a secret manner, et cetera, it would be, I believe, four years, but it could be three. Okay, so I have a few questions. And, and again, the first question was, why is this targeted just to schools? And I, the thing about this issue is it's, it's so abhorrent, and I don't think people realize just as one profession compared to another profession. This is the profession when this kind of stuff happens, and thankfully I've never been in a building where it's been caught happening, but I have friends that have been in buildings where things have happened. 
and the blame they put on themselves, everyone in that building, that community, thinking what did they miss, why didn't they see it, why didn't they know, just blaming themselves for things they shouldn't be blaming themselves for. Again, this is a profession where people literally take bullets for these kids. And so to always continue with the impression that it's also this profession where, where people go in to do anything but protect the kid and, kids and allow that to become the narrative, I will always push back against. Yes, one case is way too many. But again, we have to remember the people that are in these buildings and the sacrifices they're making to protect our children. We also have to remember they're not the number one group that is grooming or attacking our children either. And, and that's why not including these other groups, but just schools makes it seem, when CCSD alone, what are we at, 16,000 teachers alone and 320,000 staff? And again, this is just one school district. We're not even including or talking about the other school districts in this bill. Now, in this case, this gentleman clearly looked at the laws and used it for his benefit. But in most cases, I think we agree that someone that is that sick, they're just that sick. But if you're going to do a law like this, there's still too many gaps. And that's what assembly members have been asking. What about, what about, what about? And so why not completely close the gap? There was a case in Michigan maybe five, six years ago. It's been a handful of years. And I remember reading it, and it was a, a case between a teacher and a student, but it did become a sexual relationship. And her defense was that he was 18. The district's position was that it didn't matter that he was 18 and considered a legal adult. He was still in the school and a student at the time, so it didn't matter that he was of legal age of 18. It didn't matter, as you said, that at 18 years old, someone has the right to leave their parents' home. Most of us, I believe, agree that there's a difference between an 18-year-old in high school and an 18-year-old out of high school. And so why doesn't it, it just expand to the point of graduation? If that 18-year-old is in school, they are still under that authority and protection of that school district. John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, I, I think your point about um, it just dealing at this point with the school setting is well taken. Um, I will say that it was Detective Caldwell who approached my office about the potential for this legislation, which is why we started here. Um, and uh, with respect to the teaching profession, I, I could not agree more. In fact, I started my professional career as a teacher at Canyon Springs High School in North Las Vegas. I opened the school and taught two years there. So I am fully aware of, you know, sort of shining a light on teachers, maybe a bit unfairly when there are other um, activities out there that are, that are just as egregious. But uh, this was presented to us by Detective Caldwell, and this, this is the issue that um, SB 38 uh, tries to address at this point. But like I said, if you want to uh, broaden this beyond just a school setting, you, you have open ears here, and I'm sure the AG's office would fully agree with that. With respect to the 18 issue, I'll, I'll note that subsection 1 does limit it to 18, and that was at the request of LCB due to the fact that an 18-year-old um, has agency and can leave their house whenever they want. But subsection 2 does not limit it to 18. So that's the one that explicitly uh, talks about sexual contact, use of a communication to transmit a sexual image, and um, et cetera. So that is not limited by age. The other concern May is... May I say something? Sorry. Sure. I'm sorry. May Matthew Caldwell, for the record. I'd just like to say that when something like this happens, it's a traumatic event for everyone, uh, not only the student, the staff members at the school, the people that, that the kids at the school, and our intent is not to target teachers or say teachers are bad people or staff members are bad people. We're just trying to prevent things from taking place, and that's really it. So I, I understand how you feel about that, and I like what you're saying about including other groups. I think part of the issue with 
changing some of the laws is that 16 is, is le legal age of consent in Nevada. So if another adult met a 16 year old somewhere else and they weren't in a position of authority over them, they could basically say whatever they wish to them or engage in a sexual relationship with them. And that's why the other parts of the law would need to be changed to, to fix those issues. Yes, I hear you, but we've also, this body has also created laws against people in custody, not being able to give consent, people in prison, and, and those, you know, full-fledged adults. And so it really comes back to the, the difference between someone in authority and, and whose role really should be protection and um, someone who's not. Yes, granted, someone that scenario where those are just two unrelated people that run into each other um, wherever is not the same. It's about the authority um, and the actual role. So with that, my other concern was about, I think you mentioned something about after the fact, like someone after they graduated which then at that point, if we're looking at it seriously, you could consider the entire time they were in the school as grooming. And, and someone in this case of that individual teacher, um, which I'll let you know, the next question is we're going to ask how many cases of this actually happens in the state of Nevada. But in that case, where like this individual who literally was using the law knew, thought he had found the loopholes, thought he could get away with it, could also be the same individual who could say they're going to wait till they graduate. Now they're 18, they've graduated, they're not at the school, now I have free reign. But we know technically what they were doing was just using that time as grooming just to wait. What happens then? John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, th that's a great question and it would be fact specific. If we can prove that the uh, communication evidenced an intent to commit one of the sexual acts outlined while the, the uh, pupil was still a student, then we could proceed with prosecution. Now, if we cannot and do not have evidence to show that, we're not gonna be able to prosecute even under the, uh, the new statute proposed by SB 38. And I, I understand right now that my demeanor is rough, but I think people need, I don't know if people really understand. I, I don't know if people really understand that how we as educators feel about this. You know, when we're in that room every day. And when most of us could never even imagine just like most of you all, as adults, as healthy human beings, we, we just can't even imagine ever. And, and so the, you know, the accountability we take on ourselves when that happens, it's just, yeah, it's just, I, I can't even articulate right now. So I don't see any additional questions from members right now, but if someone has those numbers too of how often something happens in the state. Detective Caldwell, yeah. Matthew Caldwell for the record. That's really difficult to quantify because most of these relationships are secretive in nature. And then if we investigate, um, most of the things that come to us, they come to us as a rumor. Like uh, we'll hear that Sarah's spending too much time with John. We've seen Sarah in John's classroom after school or maybe Sarah was out by John's car in the parking lot. Um, we'll look into those cases, but the majority of the time, the victim won't tell us anything because they're in, a re they're almost, they're in a relationship with this staff member, and it's almost like they're dating and they're in love and they're protecting that person. Then they'll take steps to actively delete and destroy information. In our department, we utilize uh, Cellbrite to go through people's cell phones. The same program the FBI, the U.S. Secret Service uses, um, every other major law enforcement agency. And we'll do our best. If we get consent from the victim, we can search their phone or we can ask their parent for consent. But sometimes that's denied too and we just have nowhere to go with it. So we do try very hard to investigate every one of these cases. And to talk more about what you said earlier, if a student leaves the school and they tell us about something afterwards, we're going to look into that. And we're going to look forward, look to see if there's a crime there. If there's not a crime, we're going to communicate with employee management relations. That's the uh, arm of the school district that investigates employee related issues that are administrative in nature, then they could take um, sanctions against that staff member if we can't do something on the, process, or on the criminal side. 
How many, and I, I, I think we appreciate that to um, what you stated about students believing they're in a relationship. But how many of these reports that you get are also unsubstantiated? Matthew Caldwell, for the record, to say they're unsubstantiated is difficult because we don't know if they're being truthful with us or not. Like I said, they're in a relationship with that person. They're trying to be secretive. And that goes back to what you said earlier when a staff member tries to blame themselves because they work in the same building as, as the other staff member that's committing a, a crime like this. They simply would almost have no way of knowing because it's not out in the open. They're not walking through the school holding hands. They're communicating via Snapchat, via Instagram, instant messages on their phone. It's not out there in the open for everybody to see. So it's very, it's very difficult to say. I, I was actually getting at how many are, because, uh, you know, everyone in that building is also subject to false accusations. So that's what I was getting at. How many, not that you're not able to investigate, but how many are just false accusations? Or I don't know if, but if you're the ones who decide or if that's before you, but how many are not substantiated? Matthew Caldwell, for the record, I, I would say if we investigate um, 10 cases, we may make two or three arrests. So that would probably be, you know, somewhere in that range. But just all it's all fact, um, it's all fact dependent. It's it's very it's very difficult because you have an uncooperative victim, and then you have a suspect that, that doesn't want to talk to you either. So it's a very hard position to be in, and we do the best we can with what we have. And to say if we can disprove something, we're absolutely going to do that. Our job is not to try and arrest somebody. Our job is to follow the evidence and present the facts. That's it. We, you have, we, we don't get paid commission. We do not get anything for arresting people. That is not our goal. Our goal is to find the facts and follow the facts. Out of those seven hypotheticals that you don't make an arrest, how many of those were based on maybe the victim not cooperating or just there wasn't enough to move forward? Matthew Caldwell, for the record, it's it's hard because, like I said, you know, we don't know if the person is being honest with us or not. Um, kids, unfortunately, are very good liars now, and we'll try and verify what people are saying to us, and we'll do our best to, you know, verify things. It, but like I said before, too, a lot of these things come to us as rumors, so it's not actually an accusation that there's something happening. It's just a potential that something could be happening, and we take those things seriously because they could, you know, develop into a, a life-changing event for that student. If a student engages in a relationship with a staff member, those are things that follow them for the rest of their life. And they may not think about it when they're 15, 16, 17, or 18, but when they're 25, they're probably talking to their therapist about it. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, so, but again, what are the numbers? What are the numbers from, so how many investigations did, and again, I'm curious why we have 17 school districts and charter schools and countless private schools and yet we're only talking to one district so that's very curious as well because again this isn't just an issue in Clark County but in Clark County how many investigations say in the last calendar year or last school year were there and how many convictions Matt. or or actually substantiated cases Matthew Caldwell for the record I would have to get that information for you. And sometimes that stuff is difficult because we have um, officers assigned to schools, we have patrol officers, we have sergeants and lieutenants. And if a case comes to them and they don't feel it meets the standard of a crime, they may not investigate it as such. And if they call us, we have roughly a six person detective bureau that covers um, all of Clark County. So we'll respond anywhere and investigate cases that we feel may be criminal in nature. So I, I could check for, on those numbers for you and try and get that back to you. Yes, we'd appreciate it if you could submit that to the uh, committee, as well as Mr. Jones for the state as a whole, because this is a state law, not just a district law. Um, you know, most of us are probably trying to count in our head what we're based on articles that we see or news clippings that we see that, and, and again, the media is so crafty, half the time you start reading it and it's not even Nevada, you find out it's in some other state. Um, but just, again, wondering, because it's interesting that there are no numbers, and yet I would think that someone should be tracking how many at least reports or accusations of this occur. 
and John Jones on behalf of the Nevada Di District Attorneys Association, and, and my office would not have stats on this crime because our position is right now some of this conduct is not criminal. But I will work with Detective Caldwell to see if we can at least get you some, how many open investigations have they had, how many were closed as unsubstantiated may not be the word. And then I can also get you how many um, prosecutions we've had under our current uh, student teacher sexual conduct statute. So I think that will help uh, provide some context as well. Yes, and I think we're not, we don't care as much as the, the different, just any kind of that that would fall under student inappropriate behavior period. But yes, at least at the school district levels, there should be some tracking of how much has been reported to the police. Matthew Caldwell, for the record, the way, there's a, a factors there too. It depends on how the case how the case is called in, and then how it's categorized by the officer when they file the report. So if they call it a suspicious circumstance, that can encompass a lot of different things. If they call it um, sexual misconduct, and of course that'd be very easy to find. So it all depends on how they categorize the event to look it back up. But all of our officers are trained in how to deal with those things. It, it doesn't mean that everybody does exactly what they're supposed to every single time, but I would say the vast majority of the time they're going to make the right decision. If they're unsure, they'll call the sergeant over the detective bureau or, or the on-call detective to ask them how they should proceed with the case um, where their staff members involved with possible sexual conduct. Okay, thank you. With that, we will go ahead and open it up for testimony. Those here, we'll start in Carson City first. Those here who would like to uh, testify in support of Senate Bill 38. <coughs> Excuse me. Please remember to state your name and spell it for the record. Mr. Cherry, is there water down there? Yeah, no, I'm good. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee for the record. David Cherry, Government Affairs Manager for the City of Henderson. Uh, we support SB 38 and appreciate the work of Mr. Jones and others who have participated in crafting the bill before you today. The City of Henderson uh, is home to tens of thousands of public and private school students, and we want to see every step taken to ensure that they are protected from those in positions of authority or trust who would seek to take advantage of them or lure them into actions that could have severe physical and or emotional consequences. SB 38 seeks to respond in law to what we are seeing occur in Nevada when it comes to students. And while it does not address every setting in which the type of behavior that we heard about in testimony this morning can take place, it does seek to close a gap in the law that could leave the judicial system unable to punish those who prey on teens at a time when they may be most vulnerable to the influence of those in positions of authority and trust in a school setting. For these reasons, we urge your support for SB 38. Good morning, Chair Miller, members of the committee, Jason Walker, J-A-S-O-N-W-A-L-K-E-R, testifying in support of Senate Bill 38 on behalf of the Washington County Sheriff's Office and the Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. Children should never be subject to actions or behaviors like this, especially in a school. This is a good bill. Good morning, Chair Miller and the Assembly Committee on Judiciary. My name is Chris Reese, it's R-I-E-S, and I represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We're in strong support of SB 38, and would like to echo our comments of Mr. Cherry and uh, Sergeant Walker, as well as a presentation by the Nevada District Attorneys Association. Thank you. Chair and members of the committee, Jessica Ferrato, F-E-R-R-A-T-O, here today on behalf of the Nevada Association of School Boards. In addition, Mary Prasinski had to be in finance this morning, so my testimony today is also on behalf of the Nevada um, Association of School Superintendents. We're here in support of SB 38. I would like to spe specifically call your attention to sections 19 to 25 and 33 of the bill. We are here to promote safe and respectful learning environments for our students. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else here in support? Is there anyone there in Las Vegas here to support the Senate bill? I'm sorry, yes, the Senate bill. Not seeing anyone in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, will you open the lines? There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Then I will open it up for opposition of Senate Bill 38. Is there anyone here in opposition of Senate Bill 38? Is there anyone there in Las Vegas? Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line? 
There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Then I will open it up for neutral testimony. Is there anyone here in neutral for Senate Bill 38? Is there anyone in Las Vegas? Broadcasting, will you open the line? There are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Then I will welcome Mr. Jones. Do you have any final remarks? No, go ahead. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Chair Miller. For the record, Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff for Attorney General Ford. And so listening to the policy committee this morning, hearing a couple of things, so I kind of want to echo back to make sure we're capturing the, the essence of some of that so that we're on the right track moving forward. So we at this point have identified a specific problem and proposed a bill with a specific solution, but hearing an appetite about broadening that in some way. And so we are happy to engage in those conversations. To date, um, those additional areas, um, kind of as we heard on the record, we, we haven't vetted those, we're happy to do so. As you know, it, we're kind of all under the gun to, um, to make sure that, you know, language can work, language is not too broad, language is narrowly tailored, and also something that's not gonna have unintended consequences. So anyone who would like to engage in those conversations going forward, you know, absolutely willing to talk about that because it'd be some, quick, some pretty quick work to look through statutes and chapters um, in some of those other areas, but we've got the time and we're happy to do so. Thank you so much, and I, I know, um that you can expect there are some members that want to reach out. Um, and and also with that, I also want to remind everyone, we are on a time limit. Next Friday is the deadline for um, second House passage out of committee. And so that data we would appreciate uh, quickly because again, we would like to see that data of how often this is actually happening. So with that, thank you. And I will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 38. Our next hearing is Senate Bill 61, also from the Attorney General's office. Senate Bill 61 will be presented by Chief of Staff Teresa Benitez Thompson, and it revises provisions relating to exploitation involving the deposits of proceeds of an account held by an older person or a vulnerable, per vulnerable person in joint tenancy. And so when you are, and I also see you have a co-presenter in Las Vegas, so please introduce him when you're ready to proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you, members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford. Um, thank you for the opportunity to discuss Senate Bill 61 and the subject matter that we feel is very important for consideration before you today. Um, I have two presenters down south. I have Colleen Baharad, and who will be speaking um, about this bill. I also have up here in the north, Senior Deputy Attorney Homa Woodrum as well. Just to put some context, we are talking about the abuse, neglect, exploitation, isolation, or abandonment of older and vulnerable persons um, within Chapter 200. And as we set it off, I think there's a policy statement within that statute that really sets forth kind of the mission that we are trying to move forward with. So the policy statement that this has been in place since uh, about 1981 in the state says, it's the policy of the state to provide for the cooperation of law enforcement officials courts of competent jurisdiction, and all appropriate state agencies providing human services in identifying the abuse, neglect, exploitation, isolation, abandonment of older persons, and vulnerable persons through the complete reporting of abuse, neglect, exploitation, isolation, abandonment of older persons. And today we're going to be talking about the, the intersection of all of those different entities regarding exploitation, specific to exploitation when people have um, a joint bank accounts and that joint tenancy and I'll hand it over. I think we're going to Colleen first. Is that right? No, uh, Homa first and then Colleen. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Homa Woodrum, H-O-M-A, last name W-O-O-D-R-U-M. I'm a senior deputy attorney general with the Nevada Attorney General's Office. Also presenting Senate Bill 61, um, as our chief of staff indicated, is Clark County Chief Deputy District Attorney Colleen Baharov. Ms. Baharov will briefly discuss the existing law related to exploitation and why Senate Bill 61 is crucial to protecting the rights of Nevada seniors and people with disabilities. I will then walk through the bill and offer some additional remarks and we will look forward to your questions. Thank you. Colleen Baharov for the record. 
Thank you, Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak to you today. I am Colleen Baharov. I am the Chief of the Elder Abuse Unit at the Clark County District Attorney's Office. We are the unit responsible for prosecuting cases involving abuse, isolation, abandonment, and exploitation of older and or vulnerable persons here in Nevada. I am here today with Ms. Woodrum to present to you Senate Bill 61. This bill has been presented to all of you because after 2018, our most vulnerable citizens, our elder and differently abled citizens, have been left unprotected from exploitation by persons who are meant to help them, merely because that caregiver has been added to an account belonging to that elder or differently abled person. The law after the Nevada Appellate Court decided NATCO versus State in 2018 found that this caregiver being added to an account constituted a gift of the entirety of the account to the caregiver. This gift is to the exclusion of the needs of the elder or vulnerable person who originally owned that account. I want to be clear, Senate Bill 61 does not add a new crime in Nevada. It does not change any penalties for already existing crimes. What it does do is protect our seniors and most vulnerable residents from exploitation by a caregiver. As Ms. Woodrum indicated, exploitation of an older and or vulnerable person is codified in NRS 200.5092. As you can see, it is a crime that involves caregivers taking advantage of our most vulnerable residents. It is a crime that requires obtaining control through deception, intimidation, or undue influence over the assets or property of that resident with the intention to deprive them of the use or benefit of their own assets or property. It involves the conversion of assets from these elder and vulnerable citizens, depriving them of the use of their own assets or property. To be clear, we are talking about caregivers taking advantage of our vulnerable citizens. In 2018, the Nevada Appellate Court determined that the district attorney has to prove that at the time the caregiver is added to an account, at the time their name is added to that account belonging to an elder and vulnerable resident, that they had the intention to steal that money. This is rarely, if ever, the case. As most of you are probably aware, exploitation is a crime of opportunity. It involves gaining the trust and confidence of our elder and vulnerable residents and striking when they are least able to protect themselves. The triggering event is typically hospitalization or incapacitation. The exploitation is often not discovered until families are looking at why their senior or vulnerable family member is destitute and cannot pay for much needed care. In the last 12 months alone, at least 32 cases of exploitation have been presented to the Adult Protective Services here in Clark County. These cases involve a caregiver gaining ownership of the account belonging to our elder or vulnerable resident and then emptying that account. None of those cases were able to be prosecuted due to the decision by the Nevada Appellate Court in Nevada versus State. This means that at least 32 families have no recourse under the law. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were removed from the assets of our most vulnerable residents without recourse. As the law stands after NATCO and without the intervention of SB 61, our elder and vulnerable residents are unprotected. It bears repeating, currently, without your intervention, our seniors and differently abled citizens are at risk. I will now turn to Ms. Woodrum to walk you through the bill. Thank you. Homa Woodrum for the record, Office of the Attorney General. Senate Bill 61 has five sections. Section 1 adds language to Chapter 200 of the Nevada Variety Statutes to expressly state that a mere fact that an account is held jointly does not preclude charges against a person for exploitation of an older or vulnerable adult. Our office's proposed amendment that you'll see on Nellis emphasizes that each element of exploitation must be proven, as has always been the case under Nevada law. Important to this committee's review of Section 1 is the existing language of NRS 200.5092 defining exploitation. One, a trusted relationship with the older person or person with disabilities. Two, obtaining control of assets with the intent to deprive 
or converting assets with the intent to deprive. The conversion of assets with the intent to deprive was added to statute 20 years ago in 2003 via Assembly Bill 126, a bill specifically brought to address, and I quote from the legislative history of when the bill was first presented in 2003, Assembly Judiciary, quote, cases in which a trusted person is given control or possession of assets belonging to a senior in a lawful fashion, and then the trusted person simply disposes of those assets for their own benefit. And that is in the existing law. But Natco v. State changed the course uh, based on a banking statute related to joint accounts. Sections two through four make conforming adjustments to reference for section one elsewhere. Section five addresses NRS 100.085 related to joint accounts and held in joint tenancy, adding language that refers the reader back to section one. Cases of exploitation are devastating for victims and deprive them of the benefit of the care and comfort of their own savings and income. When those victims must seek public assistance because of exploitation, current law forces them to seek hardship waivers instead of being directly eligible for programs such as Medicaid. That bears repeating, they are denied Medicaid because of the funds that they have been deprived of because there is no law enforcement component to the case, given that it cannot be charged at this time. There is, of course, the cost to the state to cover the services for that individual, that that individual save to cover that themselves. When our public guardians must step in to assist at these triggering events, they are left with little to no funding for the protected person's needs. In Elko County, a caregiver gained access to a man's account with a promise to assist him in his affairs, and then emptied that account of $327,000. No case could be made with law enforcement to pursue the caregiver criminally for this egregious conversion because of the NATCO decision. When the man applied for Medicaid, he was denied because there was no criminal case to show that he had not simply given $300,000 away. Ultimately, the Elko County Public Guardian worked incredibly hard to enter into agreement with the state of Nevada to secure a waiver to allow for Medicaid coverage. State Medicaid then expended over $70,000 of state funds to pay for his care as a result. Sadly, he then passed away without the comforts that he had worked his entire life to save for. That is a wrong that must be righted. And th now we would welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Our first question will be from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I just want to make sure that if there is um, a transmutation from separate property into community property in a marital situation, that that's not going to be part of this, covered by this. Thank you for the question. Homo Woodrum, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Cohen. Please go direct. Thank you. I was waiting for that. I should just ask. Um, the, 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 we've gotten this question, um, and I think it's a valid question. We don't want to intrude upon the already existing civil remedies or, or um, bodies of law related to how assets are characterized, but I would direct the committee to um, s Section 3, um, which is located. This is the existing statute, but it features in Section 2 um, where we are amending. It talks about the definition of exploitation, and it talks about undue influence. And on page four of the bill, it says, undue influence means the improper use of power or trust in a way that deprives a person of his or her free will and sub substitutes the objectives of another person. The term does not include the normal influence that one family member, um, that one member of a family has over another. So the definition of undue influence would, would protect the situation that you're talking about related to whether something's a community asset or a separate asset and people are conducting their normal affairs as a married couple might. The, the exploitation statute is not meant to capture, um, you know, marital property in that way. Colleen Bahara for the record. I can also inform you um, that we do not prosecute those cases involving marital property. That is a matter strictly for the family court and that would not involve exploitation. Follow up, Chair. Yes, please. Okay, and just, just to be sure, even if there is a transmutation, so they take the separate property and put it into the joint account, still it's not covered by this. That's correct. This statute would not include that kind of conduct as a criminal conduct. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Could you also just explain and clarify the one instance that you gave? You said gained access. And so gained access is, um, there's a lot of ways someone can gain access to someone's account. Are you saying they convince that person to become a joint signer on their account? Or a joint owner? I should say that's actually more proper, joint owner on that account. Thank you for the question, Homo Woodrum, for the record. The, um, the exploitation, exploitation statute has two scenarios. One relates to the, the intent to deprive at the time you gain access. So that might be the example you're talking about where somebody convinces someone using a position of trust, please just add me to this and then immediately, and you know, empties the account, but the issue of conversion has to do with at the time that they're added, perhaps their intention was to help, right? So perhaps the intention was, let me help pay your bills, that online banking's too hard, can you just put me on the account, I'll make sure your bills are paid. And that's why we made sure with the proposed amendment to talk about you must prove every element of exploitation, because just being added to help someone on an account wouldn't trigger exploitation. It has to do with the scenario where you're added, at the time you meant well, and then this crime of opportunity presents itself. Maybe the person falls on hard times. A lot of these cases we have people dealing with addiction, and they see the opportunity in this bank account, and maybe they mean to put it back, but they have the intent to deprive when they remove the funds. And that's the key with NRS Chapter 100. A joint account is not a gift. It does not mean if I'm on a joint account with someone, we have a shared ownership of those funds. So while it exists in that account, there's the potential that I could take it or the other person could take it. But at that point, it is unrealized. The conversion happens when you go to the bank and you take $300,000 out, and now the person who was also on that account is deprived of their shared use. And all the, the totality of the facts, and I think Ms. Baharov can even mention this, the totality the facts would look at how is that account historically used. If I have a bank account with somebody and we both put our social security check into it, it would never rise to exploitation because it shows a, a positive intent through the life of the account to share those funds. What we're talking about are these very clear situations where someone, unfortunately, and I'll mention this as someone who's done a lot of estate planning, it is really easy as an estate planning tool to just add someone to the account to get a little help. Yes, we should go get powers of attorney. Yes, we should go through all the proper processes. But what we want to do is address the fact that Nevadans are using this as a tool. And I will mention that our office has tried to do education, outreach. Please, please, please do not add people to accounts when you want help paying bills. But I also don't want to deprive people of a really low cost and efficient way of getting help. And I'll mention as well that in the world we're in, we see all the bad cases. And I just definitely want to give a shout out to all the caregivers who are on account and act honorably. Like we are not a trying to make them nervous or make them concerned about offering help through supported decision making or other means. We're talking about these very egregious cases that come to us when someone is now destitute and homeless because all of their assets have been taken and the individual who took it faces no consequences. And thank you because that was going to be my question as well is how much education has been put out there about don't, don't, don't. Even in marriage, we, there's sometimes, it, because the same risk is there, right? And so that education about don't do it when you can do power of attorney, or even there are, you know, many banks have bank trust, that just free trust, you can just go sit down in the bank just for that point. Um, there, there's a lot of guardianships, a, a lot of other scenarios. Um, so I, I was going to ask that question about that as well. And so how much I guess, too, we're getting at how much education is out there. And, and I also don't like to see caregivers on accounts because that puts them at risk as well. Just, um, but, um, and then how often does this happen? Because, again, we hear one case, but how often is this happening? Thank you so much. So um, I'll start off for the record. Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford. And when I first came into the office, um, this is one of the bills that I read and I identified and I have been open and saying my favorite bill of the session, uh, second is every one of your bills, but my favorite bill of the session is this one because just um, having worked professionally as a social worker for so long, especially in acute care where people have uh, in, in the hospitals really prolonged hospitalizations, we're constantly encouraging people, identify your helpers, get your, this is a call to action time, who can help you with what? And when we have had times where people talk about their, their money being taken away, we just make the call to Adult Protective Services and we assume that justice will find these people down the road and there'll be an investigation. And so when I came in and learned that 
that wasn't so and all the great work that they had tried to do on the education level never just made it down to the helpers and the professional helpers where they're meeting people at their most vulnerable. It, it just wasn't getting down to the ground level where I can openly say, I, I didn't know that there was this great brochure. We don't have a marketing budget. I don't think anywhere in HHS do they have a marketing budget or APS has a marketing budget. So we can print some flyers and hope they get out there. But I think the truth is, is most of the community doesn't under, have that understanding. Also to, um, I think our goal too is to get back to the cases that we were able to prosecute pre the Nakato appellate decision. And so we do have a precedent of what these cases looked like and the types of cases that would be investigated and brought forth uh, for, for prosecution. And so we, we really tried to make sure that now as we get statute to match the practices we used to do that we are making that narrow in how we talk about it um, and narrow so that we can kind of go back to how we were conducting these um, investigations that would come to us from adult protective services or somewhere in that human health and human service world pre-2018. And I just want to put that on the record so that if for some reason we saw a large deviation we don't expect it we don't expect marital cases to land up in this because they weren't before um, so so we just want to put that on the record as clearly our intent and that we think we've got language to get us there but um, if if there were any confusion then we would certainly be following and come come to back cleanup but we think we're we're there Colleen Bahara for the record if you, if you don't mind. Uh, Chair Miller, you, you asked how often is this happening. Adult Protective Services identified 32 cases in the last 12 months that they were not able to push to or toward law enforcement or prosecution because of the NATCO decision. Prior to, the, prior to that last 12 months, um, I have been on the elder abuse unit since I think September of 2019. When I joined that unit, we had approximately 15 cases apiece of elder exploitation. Now, due to the NATCO decision, my unit has 15 cases total. So, and some of those cases are older. They, the people were in warrant for a period of time during COVID, so we weren't able to prosecute them until now. But the, the ability to protect these people has been diminished substantially, uh, even by the adult protective services number of 32 in the last 12 months. And just to add, Homa Woodrum, for the record, that's 32 in Clark County alone. Adult Protective Services had to manually look through cases to find language that related to joint accounts in order to provide us that statistic. I also contacted the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services. They handle these waivers when someone is disqualified for, for Medicaid eligibility because it shows some sort of fraudulent transfer. That's how it looks to them. And remember, these are the only ones where people have taken the time to appeal and then request still to be on Medicaid. Um, they're, these are egregious amounts amounts of money so maybe not you know hundreds of cases but the ones that are there really matter as recently as a couple months ago there was a case two hundred sixty five thousand dollars customers uh, caregiver removed funds from the bank account and then refused to pay the facility so this person was out two hundred sixty five thousand dollars and now needed Medicaid to pay the facility uh, because the person said it was a joint account it's mine um, another case uh, that mentioned the $327,000 case out in Elko, um, I, the Douglas County Public Guardian let me know that right now they have two cases involving joint accounts and allegations of depriving people of assets and now these individuals have to fall onto our social safety net, which is there for them and happy to assist. But really there's a major difference and I'm the biggest proponent of Medicaid there as I used to represent them. But there's a, something to be said for the freedom to choose how you spend your money and how you spend your years with your savings. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I'm, I'm going to ask from the opposite position again. Um, are there any times when accusations are made? Because again, the vulnerability for the person in that joint account, which is why I said I, I hate to hear that caregivers, even in the right intention, are doing that because they're vulnerable as well. Um, and, and I do have a banking background as well. And so I know this stuff and have seen every single thing that can happen with money. Um, but the accusations that then go against, do we see cases of that happening here? Homa Woodrum, for the record, 
I think that the, the key is that the accusation is never, um, there's a joint account out there, or you know, uh, granted banking institutions are mandatory reporters, and they would report to Adult Protective Services. The triggering event we see is never really about necessarily the conduct with the money. It's that we've found somebody who is in need of assistance, and then we start digging. And if, the, if, if in the digging you find that a caregiver was on account, that, that doesn't automatically trigger, oh, we're going to look at exploitation. What happens is we're tracing the, you know, for example, money that now disqualifies them for Medicaid or that sort of situation. But no, it's not, it's not a trap for people to fall into. And as, as our chief of staff indicated, we know for um, 15 years, years up until this Court of Appeals case exactly how these were handled and it was not you know capturing individuals and we have statistics about the volume of cases and then we can see the drop off in 2018 unfortunately we don't have data necessarily about um, these joint account cases because very quickly our law enforcement partners realized that they weren't going to go anywhere and they were told not to expend resources investigating them and so unfortunately I don't have concrete data about how how it would happen after NatCo's passage but I don't believe that we're ever in a situation but I will say when someone makes sort of a bare accusation Adult Protective Services has thousands of cases statewide they're you know they have policies and they're incredibly trained as social workers to approach this with a social work model so they don't come in looking for bad actors they come in saying I have a senior or vulnerable person who needs shelter let's get them resources and then they maybe make a law enforcement referral from there so that's interesting so you're saying that the report or the complaint isn't doesn't start with I had this joint account and this happened it starts starts with I have a financial need and then it's just discovered that's interesting okay and, and to add to that point, and Teresa, Barra, oh, sorry, just to add to that point, then I'll go to Colleen, uh, Teresa Benitez Thompson, referring back to the policy of the state. It is that intersection with health and human services, law enforcement, the courts around exploitation. So that's typically um, when you do the, the Medicaid application with the person and uh, they're telling you that they have no funds or resources. One of the questions that's asked is, have you given away money in the past five years? Um, and so when you get to that point with them and they like, well, I had some money, but then this person took it. It's like, well, did you file a police report? Or um, that's where you, that conversation starts, but they're presenting through that Health and Human Services, Adult Protective Services. Thank you, Colleen Bahar for the record. Uh, while we don't have statistics on how often the case, you know, they're not investigating that case, what I do have for you is in the last four years since I've been on that unit, we have had one case where the, the person who accused someone else of exploiting them wasn't telling the truth, and we found that information out well in advance of prosecution in the very, very early stages because we are required by law to provide proof at hearings, as, the, as you are all well aware. We look through the bank records, we're able to discover the false claim, and that case has been dismissed. Great, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I still, I really appreciate the, how the, the discovery of this all and that question asking people if they've given away money. Um, with that, I will go ahead and open it up for testimony. So those here in support of Senate Bill 368, let's start in Carson City first. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Katherine Nielsen. I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. There's a long statement from us for you guys in Nellis, but I'll start with um, a brief statement. So financial exploitation of elderly and vulnerable adults includes those with disabilities is the fastest growing type of abuse in this population. One in 20 adults experience some form of financial mistreatment, but it occurs more frequently than it is reported. Almost one in 10 victims of financial abuse will turn to Medicaid as a result of their own money being stolen from them. Individuals with developmental disabilities and those that need help with activities of daily living are more vulnerable to financial abuse. Most people, when considering the aspect of domestic abuse, think of physical assault and verbal abuse. However, current research shows that financial abuse occurs just as frequently as other forms of abuse. Many vulnerable adults do not know that they're being financially abused or are being abused by someone with whom they rely on care forms. Options exist that allow the individuals to open a special needs trust that may assist in ensuring abuse does not take place. However, many people who are vulnerable may not qualify for this option or do not know that it exists. 
Current law protects the abusers rather than the victims of abuse. There is an expectation that the person with whom the individual trusts their financial security with will use the funds appropriately throughout the individual's lifetime. Current law requires that criminal intent be proven at the mo moment of joint titling in order for prosecution to take place as stated. However, most often when a vulnerable person adds a supporter to their account, they don't believe that this person will abuse them later on. Uh, by making the requested changes to the Nevada statute, individuals who are vulnerable will have their financial investments protected. Uh, from mistreatment and this will in turn not only reduce the amount of instances of abuse and, and increase the ability to persecute the abusers but will also reduce the state's cost in unnecessary Medicaid funding. Um, you can see on our very long statement we have some suggestions for you guys and we are open for questions if you need any. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller, members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is John Jones here on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association in support of SB 61. I do want to thank the Attorney General's Office for bringing the bill and uh, echo all the comments that have already been stated today. Good morning, Chair Miller and committee members. For the record, my name is Steve Walker, S-T-E-B-E-W-A-L-K-E-R, representing Lyon and Douglas County in full support of SB 61. Good morning, Chair Miller, members of the committee, Jason Walker, J-A-S-O-N-W-A-L-K-E-R, uh, testifying in support of Senate Bill 61 on behalf of the Washington County Sheriff's Office, as well as the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. We are all going to be elder one of these years, and we're hoping that this position, uh, this protection would be in place for us when we get to that point. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Miller. Hope you can see me. I'm trying to scoot in the middle chair and members of Assembly Judiciary. My name is Beth Schmidt and I represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We support SB 61 and we want to thank the Attorney General's Office for bringing this very important bill. What we see to put this a little bit in context and to, to echo what Sergeant Walker has said is we, are, we all are going to get older. Many of us have children, we have trusted family members that we can turn to. What we have seen in our investigative division is there are a lot of our Nevada citizens that have no one. They have no one to trust. And that's what we're asking in this bill is they turn to a neighbor who they trust. And it, and it may start out initially that this person doesn't have ill intent, but maybe they fall onto hard times. And this person is left with no one and it's too late by that time the money is gone. And so what we, and, and it's hard to get your head around that if you have family and loved ones that are your protection and are there for you, not everybody has that in Nevada. And so we say if these people can't protect themselves and the way the law is written now, law enforcement can't either. So what we're asking is please support SB 61 so collectively, all of us together, we can fight for and we can protect Nevada's elderly and vulnerable citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone in Car I'm sorry, in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support? Not seeing anyone broadcasting, will you open the lines? To testify in support of Senate Bill 61, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm so glad you brought up this bill. This is Connie McMullen, M-C-M-U-L-L-E-N. I'm the, the president of the Senior Coalition of Washoe County since 95, it's been established. And I have been the owner, the proud owner of Senior Spectrum newspaper for the past 30 years. I have reported many, many of these cases from the Attorney General's office throughout the years. And just this past Monday, I got a call from a young man who was concerned that his mother was being taken advantage of by his brother. So um, yes, these are hard times for many people. And oftentimes people turn to a family member to, uh, out of necessity. And in regard, uh, on the other hand, the, the, the parent will not testify against the child. These are very difficult cases, but I, I, I commend uh, 
the, the sponsors for bringing the bill forward, and I think it leads us in the right direction. Thank you very much. There are no other callers to testify in support at this time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Then I will go ahead and open it up for testimony in opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City who would like to oppose? Anyone in Las Vegas? Broadcasting, will you open the lines, please? There are no other callers to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. Then I will open up for neutral. Is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral of Senate Bill 61? Anyone in Las Vegas? Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line? There are no other callers to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you. Then I will welcome back the bill presenters for any final remarks. <coughs> Paul Woodrum for the record. We just want to do again thank all of our partners, our law enforcement partners, our HHS partners, our health and human services partners. And then um, just it's so important that we all continue to work together um, to address address the needs of our vulnerable population and ensure that you know what they've worked hard for is is protected and then they're not in a situation where we're finding out after the fact so thank you so much thank you and with that i will go ahead and close the hearing on senate bill 61. our next bill on the agenda is senate bill 368 and i do not see senator harris here i do understand that um Jordan Levy will be presenting via Zoom. Are you with us right now? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad I waited because Jordan, I had no idea. Um, so Jordan, are you prepared to present alone or is Senator Harris going to co-present with you? Um, she's not here physically. Um, I'm sorry, go My ahead. My apologies. I was, I was supposed to co-present with her, but I am prepared to present her alone. Okay, let's just give it um, just a, a few minutes to see if she's on her way. And then if not, if you're prepared to present on your own, then we'll proceed that way, okay? So just give us a few moments because often what happens is they're in other committees, they're watching, they're rushing down. I just want to get some oh, community up and here, here she is. Perfect. So... Um, Nice to know your co-presenter was prepared to present. So with that, Senate Bill 368, sponsored by Senator Harris and co-presented with Jordan Levy, who is on Zoom with us, this measure revises provisions relating to real property. And um, Senator, your bill hearing is open, so whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Miller and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Dallas Harris representing District 11. Thank you all so much for uh, taking the time to hear Senate Bill 368. Um, I have with me on Zoom uh, my intern from UNR. Uh, he just finished his internship yesterday, but we didn't get a bill presentation in for him. And so uh, you all have the pleasure of uh, being part of his very first bill presentation. And uh, Chair Miller, if it's okay with you, I'd like to let uh, Jordan make his comments and then I'll go ahead and walk through the bill and take the questions from there. Okay, Jordan, you're on, buddy. All right, good morning, Sanders and Assembly members. For the record, my name is Jordan Levy and I'm an intern under Senator Harris, as she said. I'm speaking to address the amendments to SB 368 and the utmost importance of it. SB 368 addresses a critical issue concerning discriminatory restrictions or prohibitions in written instruments relating to real property. The bill proposes a procedure for removing such discriminatory provisions, ensuring fairness, equality, and inclusivity in all communities. It aims to provide an efficient and effective process for eliminating these restrictions, promoting equal access to housing, and preventing discrimination based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender, or other protected characteristics. With this being known, I implore that you esteemed senators and the Senate members pass the amendments of this bill. 
I find it utterly deplorable that discriminatory language still exists within the bill that does not represent the shared American values such as liberty, freedom, and justice for all. There is no justice for homeowners who are forced to sign a document that claims they can be restricted from buying a house based on the color of the skin. Although it is unconstitutional to restrict someone from buying a home in a discriminatory way, the language used is dehumanizing, and as a black man who has had to work for everything in life, I find that if I were forced to sign a document that includes this language, it would make me feel less than. I would like to believe that through the efforts of leaders such as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, society strives towards acceptance and equality in all faculties of life, including language. Current language makes it hard to consider such. Furthermore, I find the immoral that such language exists and has yet to be updated. Thus, I ask those who will potentially be against this bill the question of why. In what way is the existing language justified? And if, so, and if how far as a society have we truly evolved, if discriminatory language is still permitted? If we are truly, if we are so, if we are truly to become morally righteous citizens, it starts with small things such as the language. In conclusion, Senate Bill number 368 plays a vital role in promoting equality, justice, and inclusivity in our communities. By establishing a procedure for removing discriminatory restrictions or prohibitions, this bill will contribute to a more equitable real estate landscape in Nevada. I believe it is essential for our state to adopt measures that uphold fairness and protect individuals from discrimin discrimination based on protective practices. I kindly urge you and to champion and support SB 368 and to ensure its successful passage through the legislative process. By doing so, we can create a more inclusive and welcoming environment for all residents of Nevada. Thank you for your attention on this matter and I appreciate your dedication to serving our state and its citizens. All right, thank you for that. Um, so just a little bit of history for the committee in 2019, I, along with uh, Sen then Senator Julia Ratty, uh, brought a bill meant to address these restrictive covenants after uh, lots of discussion with stakeholders where we ended up was uh, a document essentially that you could file that would be recorded uh, with your other housing documents lodging essentially your displeasure. Uh, with the language. And as the years have gone on, I think there's been maybe, I don't know, 19 of these filed in Washoe County, right? Um, not the type of participation that we would hope for. And I, I, I thought, we can do better. There's got to be a way to actually get this language out of these documents, right? Let's actually remove it. It's not operable anyway, uh, and it's frankly rather offensive that it's still there. And so uh, after many discussions with recorders um, and, and uh, the NAACP and other stakeholders, UNR, um, we've come up with something a little bit better. So the bill be that you have before you is a mechanism for any homeowner to go to a judge, you just file a petition, okay, and say, hey, I'd like to remove this discriminatory language, and the judge is gonna say, okay, yes, this is in fact language that isn't constitutional and will issue an order to the recorder. And that way the recorders around uh, the state don't have to decide themselves which language should be redacted and which language actually uh, should remain. The judge will do that for them. And you bring a court order and the, the court order will tell uh, the recorder, go ahead and redact this specific language. Okay. And then what we're going to do on top of that is also record what's called a restrictive covenant modification document. And that's going to allow recorders to tie the original document with that language in it to the new document where the language will be redacted. Important to note, it's not going to be removed. It's not like you're going to just delete it and then and then re, you know, align everything, it'll be a redaction. And so you're gonna see that black mark, that language used to be there. Also important to note, the original document will stand. This will just be for documents moving forward so that we're not erasing the history of the existence of this language. It's really important that we ensure that that history uh, remain true, right? Um, so I think we have found a mechanism uh, courts are willing to do this for free. 
uh, the recorders are, are working on uh, uh, low fees for this type of thing. Uh, I've, I've ensured that the University of Nevada, Reno, who is uh, doing a lot of this work researching these covenants, will be able to file petitions, okay, with notice to, to the homeowners. Uh, I believe we've got the right mechanism to actually get this language uh, that's unenforceable anyway out of these home documents. Uh, that is the goal. Uh, Chair Miller, I'll, I'll just note one additional uh, point here. Um, I had an amendment drafted but was unable to get it to the committee uh, in sufficient time for everyone to review, but I did want the committee to know that it is my intention to allocate $150,000 to the University of Nevada, Reno, and to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in each year of the biennium for them to continue to do the work that they have been doing, uh, for them to be able to actively, uh, proactively file uh, these, position, these petitions where they notice uh, that these, uh, this language exists in particular neighborhoods. Uh, that is something that I'm hoping to be able to present to this committee between today and any potential work session, but I did want the committee to note that it is my intention to seek uh, some dollars so that we can actually get some money behind uh, the research that is already being done. And with that, Chair Miller, I am more than happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Okay, and so Senator, with that, adding that amendment, if that amendment gets added, again, that's not up to us. It changes the scope of the bill and also the destination of that. Um, so just so that you're aware, because of course we do not deal with funding in this um, committee. With that, we do have a question. The first one will be from Assemblyman Urich. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator, for uh, this bill. I think it's a great idea. Um, and I think you answered this, but I'd like to just clarify it on the record. Of, of course, I am not a contract attorney, but I do recall uh, issues uh, with contracts that can become void when a specific provision is taken out without a severability clause. Now, I can imagine most of these uh, documents that are recorded are pretty sophisticated and probably do have a severability clause that would maintain anything that struck out. But I don't think that that might apply because it doesn't seem like we're altering the contract. We're just redacting this for public consumption. Is that correct? Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Yurick. To you through Chair Miller, Dallas Harris, for the record. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. So um, the, the language is actually already void and unenforceable. And so any severability that would have kicked in would have already kicked in. Uh, we are, yes, just redacting it for the public. In fact, uh, I think the most important part of this is that uh, a homeowner will no longer have to agree to that language in their document as they're purchasing a new home. That language will be blacked out and um, that's, that's, I think, how it, how it should be. Thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator. Good to see you again. Um, so I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. Um, previously, this would be done by a homeowner and then this bill would um, as it says in on page um, five and six there, interested persons. So it could be the owner, a representative of a common interest community, or a nonprofit. And then you mentioned the two universities. So if you could just kind of expand on that a little bit and like maybe some other organizations you're, you're thinking that would be able to do this. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Hardy, Dallas Harris, for the record. So previous to this law, uh, previous to this bill, current state of the law, is that actually another form is just recorded that would lodge the kind of homeowner's dissatisfaction with the language. Uh, in law today, there is no mechanism to redact. And so this bill would do both of those things. It would put in place a mechanism to redact the language by the homeowner or an interested party. 
Uh, and so you, I think you've nailed it right on the head. The, my intention really is for HOAs to be able to do this because CCNRs are often the same for an entire subdivision. And we could really move on this if we could get HOAs to proactively get them out of their CCNRs, right? Uh, and then my other uh, goal was to, in fact, allow organizations like UNR and UNLV that are already doing this research and, and education work to be able to also file a petition, uh, of course, with notice to the homeowner and an opportunity uh, to object. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Senator Harris, for presenting this bill. I recall in my previous life in Reno that this was an issue in the Newlands neighborhood and in neighborhoods around um, UNR had a lot of these covenants still in existence. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, maybe this is too much into the in implementation, but uh, I would hope that those, if there are interested parties who are going out to file these uh, property uh, actions that they also do education to the homeowners because I can imagine it would be very scary to get something that says that they're going against your written documents on you know your biggest purchase of your whole life your home so uh, I would just offer that that uh, hopefully there's uh, some extra customer or citizen service there uh, thank you for that point uh, assemblywoman newbie Dallas Harris for the record. Uh, and yes, that is part of the reason why I am uh, making a last ditch effort and putting a little bit of risk uh, on the line to get these institutions some dollars to do that education. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator, for bringing this. I think this is a, a critical bill. As a history teacher, I know that we have racial covenants across this state, and we were called the Mississippi of the West for a reason, and so I think it's important that we're taking these off, but you're also preserving that history so we don't forget what happened. Uh, my question is just on the process itself. The, the process itself seems pretty complicated for a homeowner to have to go to a judge and file the paperwork and get all of this done. And I think you mentioned only 19 uh, protest papers were filed on the last one. So I just want to confirm, it seems that your intention is really not necessarily for homeowners to do this, but for these organizations to do it. Is that why you're okay with the process being a little bit more complicated than the average homeowner may be able to do? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch, Dallas Harris for the record. So my actual hope is that every homeowner, once they learn about the this opportunity, would race down to the courthouse and get this petition filed. I am very much aware that that may not be the case. Um, and so I wanted to ensure that there was an option uh, for these uh, entities that are already working in this space. And, uh, you know, you, you should hear from a, a few of them today, but they are cataloging where these exist. And so they've got uh, quite a bit of information that might make it a bit easier for them to do so. Uh, the process is as complicated as it is, uh, mostly due to the fact that we don't want to require recorders to do this work on their own, right? We don't want to tell them necessarily, hey, go through every record in your county, find all this and redact it. That is quite a bit of work for them to do. Uh, we also don't want the recorders to uh, necessarily be the ones to determine exactly where this discriminatory language starts and ends, right? Because they record documents, they're not attorneys, um, they don't modify documents, they record documents, right? And so the kind of process that you see is really a function of 
Um, how can we get this done in a way that makes all of the people who have to be involved in this process comfortable? And uh, the, the best thing we came up with is uh, something similar to what happens actually if you need to have personal information redacted, right? You go to a judge, you get a court order. And then the judge will, will direct the recorders to follow uh, the court order. And so we, we took that model and tried to apply it here. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Harris, and uh, thank you to your co-presenter. Um, this is um, this is something. Um, when we moved into our house 24 years ago, and uh, when we bought the land, actually in 1997, we found that we had restrictive covenants, and it is. Um, quite startling to read the language um, and offensive. And it also, um, uh, and, and this is where my question is. So does the removal of this language also affect any of the other covenants? Because we ran into an issue um, and didn't pursue it really hard, but we there was some talk in our community that because the, this was, no longer enforceable, that that could have had some also other effects on the, the CCNRs in other areas on whether or not um, the, um, there could be a homeowner's association or a homeowner's, um, could you be an association or could you only be a community group? Um, do you know anything about how this might affect any of those things or is this going to be just very narrow is it narrowly tailored enough so that the other governing uh, mechanisms are not disturbed thank you for the question assemblywoman summers armstrong uh, dallas harris for the record it is my intention to only allow that language that is already unenforceable because it's been found to be so to be redacted uh, in the documents where they exist um, and not to um, affect any other documents in a way that they are not already currently affected by the unenforceability of those provisions. Thank you. We have a question from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Congratulations, Mr. Levy. Go back. Um, and, and thank you for bringing this bill. I, I vividly remember the hearing in 19 and really appreciate the work that you and Senator Ratty and Mr. Irvin have done on this issue and, and it's startling that it's still an issue. Um, so my question is, in the definition of interested person, did you consider including um, a neighbor? I could see a situation where maybe some property owners or renter, you know, rent out their homes, aren't really concerned with the neighborhood or really don't really care because that's in the past and they don't care about what's in the covenants, but maybe some people don't want to live next to homes that have these really horrible covenants in them or on them, I guess I should say. Yeah, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Cohen, Dallas Harris for the record. I did not actually um, think about what that would look like if we would include neighbors. Um, I think my, my hope was that at least if you're in a common interest community, once you get one of those CCNRs, because uh, it's the same CCNR for each home in the subdivision, that you could hit them all. Um, and so I'm hoping that that would, for the most part, address those issues where you don't want to be in a neighborhood or, or next to a home that has um, this particular provision in it. Um, I would also note that um, if you got a neighbor and they've got this on their, go knock on their door, let them know this petition's available, right? Um, but I am, I'm open to, to maybe including that. If we can do it in a way that doesn't make other homeowners feel like their neighbors are all up in their business. Thank you. Thank you, and I actually, appreciate the number 19, not that 19 seems a lot, but I think we often, in our bubble up here, we think, oh, now everyone knows. And in reality, there, even as much information is tried to push out, 
it doesn't always translate that quickly to um, the community. And I, I remember that hearing well. And I'm so I think 19 actually is a great number to see that that to go through that process and and that has been done and that it will only increase with that. So um, I think 19 is yeah 19 people that that knew about it that cared about it that went through the steps uh, based on principle and so I, I think that's a um, it's happening so that's good. With that. Not seeing any additional questions, I will go ahead and open it up for support of Senate Bill 368. Yes, we're, we're not under protocols. We can fill the table all at once, please. Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N, speaking for myself today as a homeowner in Reno. We bought our 1930s home in Reno in 2015. I read fine print. The covenant started out sounding quaint. We can't make moonshine. We can't run a funeral parlor. But then I read that the property can only be owned or occupied by white people. Obviously offensive. Even though such restrictions are long illegal, we still had to sign the covenant stamped read and accepted to close the sale. After that, I worked with my Senator, Julia Ratty, and Senator Harris in 2019 to pass SB 117, co-sponsored by then Assemblywoman Krasner. SB 117 seemed like the good solution, but it turned out to be insufficient. First, many of the racist covenants apply to whole subdivisions. We thought that one homeowner could file the Declaration of Removal of Discriminatory Restriction, long name, and it would apply to all properties in the subdivision, but it's not working that way. Second, the declaration is included in the documents when you buy a home, but so is the original document with the bad language. Third, it's hard to educate homeowners and get them to record these declarations on their own. SB 368 will fix these problems. The bill preserves the original historical document, which is important, but will redact the copies used in title packages as they move forward. With the help of Washoe, uh, Washoe County recorder Kaylee Work and ACLU interns, we started identifying racist covenants in Washoe County. These provisions are not subtle. <laughs> interns had no trouble identifying them once they found the century-old book. The pandemic cut that project short, but I am very pleased that some of my UNR colleagues are working on this issue. Please support SB 368. Thank you so much, Mr. Irving. And then you make the number 19 even more impressive because we forget that COVID gap so much stood still and was frozen. Um, so 19 is even more impressive. Thank you for that. Next testimony, please. Okay, hello, my name is Jacob Dorman. I'm a professor of history at UNR, and I have been building on my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Irvin's work by leading a research team which has spent the last year with um, four student uh, researchers and uh, my co-director and myself um, working to actually do this research to find out where the racial covenants are and to create a map which I have submitted by um, PDF. This shows uh, uh, the racist covenants in uh, 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 reddish brown. Uh, the areas in black are still um, to be researched. And we estimate um, that there are approximately 11,000 of these property deeds with racist covenants in Washoe County uh, alone. It takes quite a bit of research to actually um, find them. And like uh, Dr. Irvin, I have uh, found out about this when I bought a home in Washoe County in uh, 2018 because I also read the fine print. Um, I, I think that this would be wonderful um, to pass and to support uh, the work. It, it is something that takes quite a bit of, of uh, research and, and legwork um, to find this. And then um, my team would be able to uh, notify homeowners to do some education uh, about the history of um, uh, housing discrimination to give them the option of removing this or um, to remove this on, on their behalf. So I, um, I thank the assembly for your attention 
uh, to uh, this matter. And I'd also like to note that we have the support of both Provost Jeff Thompson of UNR and Provost uh, Chris Heavey of UNLV. And we have a team in place and some experience um, uh, in this issue to be able to do this research. Thank you. And also, could you please spell your name for the record? Yes, my name is Jacob, J-A-C-O-B, Dorman, D-O-R-M-A-N. Thank you. Thank you. Glad we have that correct for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cadence Matievich, C-A-D-E-N-C-E-M-A-T-I-J-E-V-I-C-H, representing Washoe County. And Washoe County is here in strong support uh, for this bill this morning. Uh, this is a bill that our Board of County Commissioners has taken official uh, policy position of support on. Uh, we are very grateful to Senator Harris for bringing the bill forward for the work that she did uh, with the recorders, county recorders, to be sure that the integrity of historical documents is maintained, uh, but that we have a way to not continue to reproduce this awful language in title documents uh, moving forward. Uh, if I may, on a personal note, I, I too am one of the people who resides in one of those 11,000 properties. Um, and I made the commitment in the, in the Senate side, and I make it here again to you and to Senator Harris, that I am going to go get in my neighbor's business um, and make sure that they know about this. Um, it's, it's a wonderful neighborhood that I live in, and I know that my neighbors will join me uh, in, in taking the action that we need to do to be sure that going forward uh, this language doesn't continue to be published. Thank you. My name is Fernando Melendez. That's F-E-R-N-A-N-D-O-M-E-L-E-N-D-E-Z. -E -E I am a student at the University of Nevada, Reno, majoring in criminal justice and political science. And as a future law student as well, I've been working on this uh, research team at the University of Nevada, Reno. And I find that history is really important to preserve. It's important to not just erase these covenants, but in order to redact them and amend them and ensure that that history is not simply erased. Um, that would be terrible for um, understanding Nevada and all of its past. Um, through my role, I have seen a lot, um, several different types of historical negative impacts on disadvantaged communities through my archival and storytelling research. I find it really important for this work to continue, and that would be in support of this bill. Um, I'd also like to provide a bit of a legal perspective. Um, these racial covenants were ruled unenforceable in 1948, deemed illegal in 1968, and these property deeds and procedures should match the laws and rulings that have been in place for several decades. SB 368 is a great way to move in the right direction to address that, and I hope you support SB 368. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is John Lall, that's J-O-H-N, last name L-O-L-L. -L. I am a first year PhD student at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, I am actually on Dr. Do Dorman's uh, research team and I've been spending the last nine months or so looking at Washoe County records and, and finding these uh, covenants. So it's been a fascinating process. Um, I just merely wanna express my support for the bill and I thank you for considering it. Hi, <laughs> my name is Stacy Wright Hemphill, S T A C I E W R I G H T hyphen H E M P H I L L. Um, I'm also a member of the research team. Um, I major in geography, and my role on the team is finding these restrictive covenants and pointing out the restrictive language in them. And um, what makes this project so important to me. As a geographer, it shows that racism is not something that people are just subject to, but live within. And piggybacking off of what Assemblywoman Summer, Summers Armstrong said, it is heartbreaking to see this language. And um, it is frightening, it's terrifying to at one point. It shows like the obstacles that many marginalized communities have had to jump through to just simply live somewhere and I personally would like to live in a state that acknowledges its past and doesn't try to erase it so that's why I think passing this bill is so important and yeah obviously testifying support and yeah thank you so much is there anyone left in Las Vegas I don't think there's anyone there Broadcasting, will you open the lines for anyone wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 368? There are no callers at this time. 
Thank you. Then I will open it up for opposition testimony for Senate Bill 368, starting here in Carson City. Not seeing anyone broadcasting when you open the line. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Then with that, I'm sorry, are you approaching um, for testimony? Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, just um, Shra Chandra, Administrator for the Real Estate Division, just here for neutral testimony. Okay, then let me open up neutral. So starting here in Carson City, is there anyone here for neutral? Okay, Las Vegas. Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Sharat Chandra, CHA and DRA, Administrator for the Real Estate Division, uh, testifying in neutral. Uh, we did work with the sponsors in 2019 on SB 117 to develop the form, and we're happy to continue the work once this, this bill uh, comes through, if there are any changes to the form. And for the record, we're not requesting any additional funding or anything to do this. Thank you. Thank you for that. With that uh, broadcasting, is there anyone on the line that wishes to testify in neutral? There are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Then I will welcome Senator Harris up uh, for any final remarks. Thank you, Chair Miller. Uh, members of the committee, I just want to thank you all for your for your time and, and hearing this bill and your questions. Uh, I look forward to um, continuing this work uh, with you all as partners. Have a great day. Thank you so much. And with that, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 368. Last on our agenda is public comment. Is there anyone here in Carson City wishing to make public comment? Not seeing anyone. Is there anyone there in Las Vegas that would like to make public comment? Not seeing anyone. Broadcasting, will you open the lines for anyone wishing to make public comment? The public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Then I will close public comment, and that concludes our business for today. So um, I will go ahead and adjourn. I know that the agenda right now that's posted does say 8 a.m. for a start time, but we will actually be starting at 9 a.m. on Monday. And with that, this meeting is adjourned, and I will see you on Monday.